Shall we pray? Father in heaven, it's again a privilege to study your word. And dear Father, we're just so grateful that you give us wisdom and understanding, fulfilling your promises. We ask now, dear Lord, that you would place us into a very, give us a very convicting, a convictive spirit. Help this room to be settled. Help it to be still. Help us to have understanding and wisdom and to know that, dear Lord, we're living in the last hours of earth's history. Guide us, be with us. And Father, we're reminded that when the first and second angel's message were going forth during the Millerite time period, you showed us, dear Lord, that fanaticism was burnt away like the frost in the morning sun. And we pray, dear Lord, that your truths will go forth in such a powerful way that all fanaticism would be dispelled. That you would all help us to leave here on the same page. That we might light this world ablaze with the glory of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I guess technically it's still the morning, so good morning to everyone. Um, if you take your syllabus, it's the thin, the thinnest one you have, thin syllabus. Turn to the, the first lesson, three tests and prophets of time. I've been asked to share not only Daniel 11 and the 1843 chart, but for the purpose of the tape also the time prophet presentation. So we'll start with that one. And it's page three of your syllabus. And as we begin, if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter one. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 4. All right. I promised Glenn that I would stay still. I usually, I'm a roamer. I like to walk around, so I'm kind of locked in here. But Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 4, and when you're there, let me hear you say amen. amen. The Bible says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. And there's a principle that we want to look at before we even begin this morning, is that the prophet, when a prophet speaks, or when the messenger of the Lord speaks, it's not their own words. It's Christ's words. Amen? What about Exodus chapter 4? Exodus chapter 4 here is referring to, to Moses here. In Exodus 4 and verse 12, the Bible says, Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And you remember when, when Moses thought that he couldn't speak, that he was slow of speech, the Lord told him that Aaron, his brother, would come, and that Moses would be to Aaron as what? As, a, as, as God, and Aaron would be as a mouth. So what Aaron was to be saying, Moses told him. And so it's the same with every prophet. When a prophet speaks, it's God's words. Notice what it says, Desire of Ages, page 799. It says, It is the voice of Christ that speaks to the prophets, patriarchs and prophets, from the days of Adam even to the closing scenes of time. So when a prophet speaks again, it's the voice of Christ. Another principle we want to set forth is in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. Hebrews 13 and 8, and when we're there again, amen. amen. Hebrews 13 and verse 8, and we know this one, it says, Jesus Christ the same what? Amen. Yesterday, today, and forever. So the way that Christ is, he's the same. The way he dealt with his people in times past is the same. And what we're going to look at today is the test for God's people from the beginning of time have always been the same. 
We're going to look at three tests. Three tests we're going to look at. And the first test on your page, on page three, is the reception of the prophet's message. The first test. The second test is a visual test that verifies the words of the prophet. And the third test always is probation's closing or a door closes. And it's just so interesting how when you look through these histories, the last one is always the closing of a door. I'll give you an example. In the days of Noah, how long did Noah preach the message? 120 years. What was a visual thing that verified his message? The animals getting on board the ark. And then what was the door closing? The angel shut the door. Let's read this on page four. You have a statement, and we'll read it in length here. This is taken from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 97 and 98. It says, the period of their probation was about to expire. And now the servant of God made his last solemn appeal to the people. With an agony of desire that words cannot express, he entreated them to seek a refuge while it might be found. Again, they rejected his words and raised their voices in jest and scoffing. Suddenly, a silence fell upon the, the mocking throng. Beasts of every description, the fiercest as well as the most gentle, were seen coming from mountain and forest and quietly making their way towards the ark. A noise as of a rushing wind was heard, and low birds were flocking from all directions, their numbers darkening the heavens. And in, in perfect order, they passed to the ark. Animals obeyed the command of God while men were disobedient. Guided by holy angels, they went two and two into, with Noah into the ark and clean beasts by sevens. The world looked on in wonder, some in fear. Philosophers were called upon to account for the singular occurrence, but in vain. It was a mystery which they could not fathom, but men had become so dark and hardened by their persistent rejection of light that even this scene produced a momentary impression. Mercy had ceased its pleadings for the guilty race. The beasts of the field and the birds of the air had entered the place of refuge. Noah and his household were within the ark, and the Lord shut him in. A flash of dazzling light was seen, and the cloud of glory, more vivid than the lightning, descended from heaven and hovered before the entrance of the ark. The massive door, which was impossible for them within to close, was slowly swung to its place by unseen hands. Noah was shut in, and the rejectors of God's mercy were shut out. The seal of heaven was on the door. And we'll stop there. Noah preached 120 years. Those who rejected the light, even the visual test of the animals getting on board the ark, made very little impression. And the last thing to happen was the door was closed on the ark. Their probation was sealed. It was done. They were lost. Another time period we can look at is the Millerite time period. And we'll, go, we'll deal with this in length as we progress. But in the Millerite time period, it was the first angel's message. Miller began to preach the first angel's message. Then the second angel's message was actually a visual test. And we're going to look at this in just a moment. And that, that visual test verified the message. And then the third angel. The third angel was doors, probation, the door of probation, closing. Early Writings, page 260. Notice what it says. It says, Many look with horror at the course of the Jews in rejecting and crucifying Christ. And as they read the history of this shameful abuse, they think they love him and would not have denied him as did Peter or crucify him as did the Jews. But God, who reads the hearts of all, has brought to the test that love for Jesus which they profess to feel. All heaven watched with the deepest interest the reception of the first angel's message. But many who professed to love Jesus and who shed tears as they read the story of the cross derided the good news of his coming. And instead of receiving the message with gladness, they declared it to be a delusion. They hated those who loved his appearing and shut them out of the churches. Those who rejected the first message could not be benefited by the second. Neither were they benefited by the midnight cry which was to prepare them to enter with Jesus by faith into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And by rejecting the two former messages, they have so darkened their understanding that they can see no light in the third angel's message, which shows the way into the holy, the most holy place. I saw that as the Jews crucified Jesus, so the nominal churches had crucified these messages. And therefore, they have no knowledge of the way into the most holy 
and they cannot be benefited by the intercession of Jesus there. So it's the same history. First angel's message. Second angel's message was actually when the doors of the churches began to close. And I'll read a statement in volume one of the testimonies. And when they closed the doors on the churches, it verified the message of Miller. And then the third angel's message comes in October 22nd, 1844, and probation closes. And a door actually closed as well. In volume one of the testimonies on page five, beginning of the, t uh, the top of the page, volume one, page 21, it says in June 1842, Mr. Miller gave his second course of lectures in Poland. With few exceptions, the different denominations closed the door of their churches against Miller. Many discourses from the various pulpits sought to expose the alleged fanatical errors of the lecture. And it wasn't just all at once. It was a progressive thing that transpired with the closing of these doors. But that closing was when the second angel's message came into history and verified the message. Now, in Revelation, flip with me there, Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. We want to look in verses 7 and verse 8. And when you're there, amen. Revelation chapter 3, 7 and 8. And we want to see that was there a door that closed? Yes, probation closed, but was there a door? Revelation chapter 3 Verse 7 and 8. Amen. The Bible says unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast little strength, and hast kept my word, and thou hast not denied my name. We all understand, what was the door that was open? The most holy place. So what door was closed? The holy place. And, we, and Jeff has been mentioning a statement in early writings that those who did not pass with Christ into the most holy place, when they prayed, they received an unholy influence or an unholy spirit. Satan was the one that answered their prayers. And this goes into the history of the test. And we're going to get into that shortly. Um, further along here, Seventh-day Adventist movement is the same thing, and this is what we're trying to prove this morning, that Sister White's message, if it's rejected, you cannot pass the second test. The second test is the image of the beast, which verifies the message. If you don't pass the second test, you don't go through the third on the right side of the door. So think of it this way. If the first test decides whether you pass to the second, and the first test, if you pass, you go through the second. And the second test, you have to go through the third. Which out of the three is the most important? The first test. The first test is the most important. I want to read a statement to you in volume three of Selected Messages, page 84, just to put this into perspective. It says, one thing is certain. Those Seventh-day Adventists who take their stand under Satan's banner will what? First give up their faith in the warnings and reproofs contained in the testimonies of God's Spirit. Those who will be lost in the end, what is the first thing they do? Give up their faith in the right. That's right. Give up their faith in the writings of Sister White. The way we're going to do this, and I don't think I'm necessarily going to use the board for this, but I want you to kind of use your mind. The way we're going to illustrate this is by looking at prophets. Now, there are certain prophets that proclaim time prophecies, and for this discourse, we'll call them proclaiming prophets. At the end of the time prophecy, when the time prophecy was fulfilled, God raised up a prophet that would gather his people. So we'll call them gathering prophets. So you have the proclaiming prophets that proclaimed a time prophecy. The gathering prophets gather the remnant that come out at the end of the time prophecy. And the gathering prophets message not only is just to a remnant or develops a remnant, but it's a life or death message. And one thing that's important to see that both the pro proclaiming prophet and the gathering prophet, their names correspond with their ministry. Their names define their ministry. So let's give you a few examples. The first time prophecy in the Bible was the 120 years. The 120 years. And Enoch would be raised up as the proclaiming prophet. Now the way he proclaimed this time prophecy is in a very interesting way. What was Enoch's son's name? Methuselah. Now what does Methuselah mean? When he dies, it will come. So the very name of his son was an acted prophecy that when he dies, the flood would come. 
And so at the end of this time period, towards the end, God raised up a gathering prophet that would gather out a remnant of people from the world, and that was Noah. Now, Enoch's name, again, means teacher. His name corresponds with his ministry. Upward look, page 228, says Enoch was a public teacher of the truth in the age in which he lived. Now, Noah, Noah means to rest or comfort or to rescue. Now, question, does Noah's name correspond with his ministry? Did Noah indeed rescue a remnant? Now, was the preaching and the word of Noah life or death? If we didn't get on the board of the ark, we were lost. All right. So how many came out on the ark? You would see that that would be a very small remnant. A remnant was gathered. The message was life or death. Second time prophecy was the 400 years in Genesis 15. You know, you have the scriptures there on your page. So for sake of time, we won't turn there. But Abraham was given the time prophecy of 400 years captivity for Israel. All right. Now, Abram, his name the name Abram on page six means the father is exalted. And everywhere Abraham went or Abram went, what did he set up? He set up altars. And so the heathen nations began to understand the worship of Jehovah. Now, when his name was changed to Abraham, it means the father of a multitude. And we know that he was the father of not only the Ishmaelites, but he was the father of Israel as well. Both had 12 sons. And so he was indeed a father of a multitude. At the end of the 400 years captivity in Egypt, who was risen up as the gathering prophet? Moses. Moses means drawn out of the water or to rescue. Now, did Moses gather out a remnant? Was his message life or death? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Jeremiah to Daniel, the second time prophecy. In Jeremiah 29, verse 10, God let Jeremiah know or proclaimed a time prophecy that there would be 70 years captivity in Babylon. Now, Jeremiah's name means Yahweh is exalted and Yahweh strikes. Now, if you look at the writings of Jeremiah, I find it's very interesting in Jeremiah and Lamentations. He is one of the uh, one of the prophets that I mean, all of them did, but he always exalts Christ or exalts Jehovah. But he is also the one to give some of the most scathing rebukes to God's people. So here you have the dual name Yahweh is exalted and Yahweh strikes. Now, Daniel is the one that came out at the end of the 70 years. Daniel was the prophet that rose up at the end of the 70 years. And Daniel means God is my judge. God is my judge. Now, Daniel is his message to a remnant. Who is that remnant? We are. So his message is to a remnant. Is the message of Daniel life or death? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we'll see that more as we begin to study a little further. Daniel is a very, very unique prophet. He is both a proclaiming prophet and a gathering prophet. So at the end of the 70 years, when he was risen up to be the gathering prophet, he then became a proclaiming prophet and proclaimed time prophecies. The first time prophecy for Daniel to proclaim, well, in, in, in frame of time, would be the 490 years or 70 weeks, the 70 weeks of Daniel chapter 9. Flip over there with me to Daniel 9. And verse 25. Daniel 9 and verse 25. And when you're there, let me hear you say amen. The Bible says in Daniel 9, 25, Know therefore, know therefore, excuse me, 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So the 70 years of verse 24 was proclaimed, 490 years, which is the 70 weeks. During this time period, during this time period, God rose up two gathering prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. Now, Haggai means one born on a feast day. One born on a feast day. Now, the, the, the sanctuary was destroyed, right? The sanctuary was destroyed. But in the, in the times of Ezra and Nehemiah, one of the first things that was put back into place was, 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 was Passover. It was a representation of how the work was going forward and God was to, to raise up his people again during the time when the, the temple was being rebuilt. So one born on a feast day. And then you had Zechariah, which means Yahweh has remembered. And we're going to see when we deal with the 2520 that what 
Yahweh had remembered was the covenant that had been broken. And that if God's people would humble themselves, he would reestablish them. And Zechariah and Haggai, they brought out a remnant from Babylon. A remnant from Babylon came out. Now, was it a life or death message? If they stayed in Babylon, what would happen? They would die. Many of them did stay. Only, only a few came out, and they got assimilated with the people. Then you have the second part to this prophecy. Daniel, again, is the proclaiming prophet. John the Baptist is the gathering prophet. Now, the, that time prophecy is the 483 years of verse 25. Now, Daniel 9, 25 says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. When you put those time periods together, it equals 483 years. And at that time period, at the 483 years, the Messiah of the Prince would come. Now, who was that? Jesus Christ. When was he designated Messiah? Baptism. Who baptized him? John. John is the gathering prophet. John rose up, gathering prophet. And John means Yahweh is gracious. Yahweh is gracious. Now, did John gather out a remnant? Who was the remnant? Right. That's right. And there was still a remnant. So the, the disciples of John, and then he went to Christ, and you have the disciples of Christ. So it was a remnant. Now, John's message, life or death? If there was no repentance in Israel, if there was no being born again, they'd be cut off. So it was a life or death message when it came to John. Now, this brings us to a time period, and this is the first time period we're going to look at together. And this is the time period of the Jews. Now, since the first test is the most important, the way I want to illustrate it is by looking at what happens when you reject the prophet. Now, there's, there are things that transpire when the prophet is rejected. We know the first test is the message of the prophet. The second test is a visual test that verifies the message of the prophet. The third test is the close of probation. The first test being the most important Let's look at the first test and see what happens when it's rejected. So if you look at early writings, page 259, on page 6, bottom of page 6, early writings 259, it says, I was pointed back to the proclamation of the first advent of Christ. Those who rejected the testimony of John were not, permitted, were not benefited by the te teachings of Jesus. Christ, Satan led on those to reject the message of John to still go further to reject and crucify Christ. In doing this, they placed themselves where they could not receive the blessing on the day of Pentecost. The rending of the veil of the temple showed that the Jewish sacrifices and ordinances were no longer to be received. But the Jews were left what? In total darkness. They lost all the light which they might have had upon the plan of salvation and still trusted in their useless sacrifices and offerings. When you look at what transpires here, John's message was rejected. What happened? When John's message was rejected, they received no more light. They were left in total darkness. They could not be benefited by the teachings of Christ. And then after that, they were not able to receive the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And then the third and final thing that happens as a result is found in Daniel chapter 9, 24 through 27. The 490 years that was cut off for Israel, at the end of that time prophecy, what happened? In 34 AD, what happened to Israel? The gospel went to the Gentiles. They were divorced, we're told, as being God's people. But something, something very specific happened. Notice Acts. Flip over with me to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, because I want to show you that probation closed upon them as a people. Acts chapter 7, verses 54 to 58. Amen. Are we there? Acts 7, verse 54 to 58. It says, after, after Stephen had been preaching, it says, When they had heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. He, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus doing what? standing on the right hand of God. Now, when Jesus Christ went to heaven, what did he do? We're told in Hebrews that he sat on the right hand of the Father. So symbolically, when, 
when, when he, Stephen is now looking into heaven and he sees Christ standing up, the standing up of Michael always represents probation's close. And so here with the Jews, when he saw this in 34 AD, probation's closed, a door closed. So the outcome of failing the first test is threefold. You cannot be benefited with more light. The second thing is you would not receive the Holy Spirit. And the third is probation's closing. And we're going to use this history and we're going to see it other times throughout history. And by the testimony of two, a thing is established. Daniel, on page seven, also proclaimed the seven years, the second half of the seven years in Daniel chapter nine. If you flip back to Daniel chapter nine, in verse 27, the Bible says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even unto the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. The last seven years of the 490 years, the second half after Christ was, was, was crucified, who were the ones that were preaching the message? The disciples. Now, one of the disciples was John. And so as Daniel proclaimed this prophecy, John was the one risen up as the gathering prophet. And John, again, means Yahweh is gracious, and he was gracious in many ways to John. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, lets us know how prophecy flowed from the Father to the Son to the angel to John and to us. John was a very, very intricate and strategic place in that, in that flow of events and how prophecy comes to the people. And John was able to actually handle Christ. He was actually able to lay upon his breast and be there with him. So God was indeed gracious to John. John, does his message gather out a remnant? Is a remnant represented in his message? Is it a life or death message? Always the same. Always the same. Finally, Daniel, at the end of the 490 years, when the gospel went to the Gentiles, Paul was risen up. Paul was risen up. And Paul, first before he was Paul, his name was what? Saul. Now, Saul, Saul means asked of God, selected or set forth. And you can look in Acts chapter nine, verse 15. God says that Paul was a chosen vessel unto himself. So Saul was actually chosen and selected of God. And his name meant just that. Now, when his name was turned to Paul, Paul means little or small. And there's verses. Let's look at one. Let's look at Ephesians chapter three. Let's see what Paul said about himself. Ephesians chapter 3. And we're going to look in verse 8. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 8. And when you're there, amen. The Bible says unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, and this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul considered himself the least of all the apostles. He wasn't even worthy, he says in 1 Corinthians, to be an apostle. So indeed, his name corresponded with his work and at least how he felt about himself. The final prophet, the final gathering prophet from Daniel to Ellen White. Now, in Daniel 8, 14, a verse that we're all very familiar with, it was the 2300 days. At the end of the 2300 days in 1844, God gathered out another gathering prophet. What we're going to do now is we're going to look to see, is her message life or death? Is her message to a remnant, for a remnant, and gathers in reality the true remnant of people? And we're also going to see how her name corresponds with her ministry. And that's what makes it so powerful, is when we look at this name. But this also brings us to the time period of the Millerite movement. It brings us to the time period of the Millerite movement. And in Daniel chapter 7, we have the judgment hour scene. You flip there with me to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel 7, verse 9 and 10, and then we'll read verses 13 and 14. Well, no, no, 9 and 10, 13 and 14. All right, so Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, 10, 13, and 14. And when you're there again, amen. The Bible says, I behold, till thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. 
A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. What time period is this bringing us to? 1844. Now, 13 and 14. It says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like unto the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom. And the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom was given to him in 1844. This time period is, is the history we're looking at. And, and you can look at the time period of the Millerites. And notice what Sister White says in regards to this early writings. Page 54 and 56. Early writings 54 and 56. On page 8. It says, I saw a throne. In all that sat the Father and the Son. Before the throne I saw the Advent people, the church and the world. I saw two companies, one bowed down before the throne, deeply interested, while the other stood uninterested and careless. Those who were bowed before the throne would offer up their prayers and look to Jesus. Then he would look to the Father and appear to be pleading with him. A light would come from the Father to the Son and from the Son to the praying company. Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from the Father to the Son, and from the Son it waved over the people before the throne. But few would receive this great light. Many came out from under it and immediately resisted it. Others were careless and did not cherish the light, and it moved off from them. Some cherished it and went and bowed down with the little praying company. This company all received the light and rejoiced in it, and their countenance shone with its glory. Now, we're going to stop there for a moment. If you take the writings, of, just in, in early writings alone, what was that exceeding bright light that came from the Father to the Son and the Son to the praying company? What was the exceeding bright light? The midnight cry. The midnight cry. Now, the midnight cry, we'll, we'll see this a little further. Some already know that the midnight cry comes under the second message. Now, according to the pattern, according to the pattern, it has to be the first message that they reject. But notice what transpires. It says, Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from the Father to the Son, and from the Son it waved over the people before the throne, and that few would receive this light. Why would they not receive the light of the midnight cry? Early writings. Go back again. Go back again to page 4. Early writings, page 260. It gives us a clue to let us know what happened. In early writings, page 260, in the middle of the paragraph, it starts off by saying those who rejected the first message. It says those who rejected the first message could not be benefited by the second, neither were they benefited by the midnight cry. So when the exceeding bright light came from the Father and the Son to the praying company, that exceeding bright light being the midnight cry, the reason why they didn't receive it is because they rejected the first message. Are you following me? The first message was rejected, therefore they could not receive the midnight cry. And notice what happened as a result back on page 8. And we're looking now on the second paragraph, early writings 54. It says, I saw the Father rise from the throne and in a flaming chariot go into the Holy of Holies within the veil and sit down. Then Jesus rose up from the throne and the most of those who were bowed down rose with him. I did not see one ray of light pass from Jesus to the careless multitude after he arose, and they were left in perfect darkness. Those who arose when Jesus did kept their eyes fixed on him as he left the throne and led them out a little way. Then he raised his right arm, and I heard his lovely voice saying, Wait here, I'm going to my father to receive the kingdom. Keep your garments spotless, and in a little while I'll return from the wedding to receive you to myself. Jump down to the third paragraph. It says, I turned to look at the company who were still bowed before the throne. They did not know that Jesus had left it. Satan appeared to be by the throne trying to carry on the work of God. I saw them look up to the throne and pray, Father, give us thy spirit. And Satan would breathe upon them an unholy influence. When you remember the time period of the Jews, they rejected John's message. They received no more light. Because they rejected the message and received no more light, they received no Holy Spirit. And then door closed upon them. Probation closed. It's the same history. During the Millerite time period, they rejected the first message. They received no more teaching. It says here, 
that they were left in perfect darkness, same as the Jews. And then the final outcome we're going to see is probation's closed, but they also, they also received an unholy influence. So it wasn't the Holy Spirit, but an unholy spirit. And when you look in Matthew 25, Matthew 25, which is the parable of the ten virgins, Matthew 25, at the end, what transpired with the virgins? Five wise, five foolish. It says here in verse, in verse 11 of Matthew 25, excuse me, uh, verse 10. It says, and while they went to buy, Matthew 25, verse 10, and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and what? The door was shut. 1844, probation closed. Same history. The outcome of failing the first test. No more light. No Holy Spirit. And probation closes. Now let's jump into looking at Ellen White. After 1844, God rose up a gathering prophet. And there's controversy over Sister White in many different circles. And one of the controversies I'm sure we've all heard is that she's the lesser light. Oh, she's, well, what does that mean? She's the lesser light. Does that mean we don't have to listen to her as much? I mean, what does that mean? So let's, let's bring some definition to the lesser light. Notice page nine. It says, the Lord has sent his people much instruction, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Little heed is given to the Bible, and the Lord has given a greater light, oh, excuse me, the Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. Oh, how much good would be accomplished if the books containing this light were read with determination to carry out the principles they contain. There would be a thousandfold greater vigilance a thousandfold more self-denial and resolute effort, and many more would now be rejoicing in the light of present truth if they read the books containing the lesser light. Now, what does the lesser light mean? The first time or the first way that we can understand what it means is how the Bible uses the term. If you flip to Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, we're going to see how the Bible uses the terms lesser light and greater light, and we're going to allow the Bible to Give us a definition of the both. Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. And again, when you're there, amen. Genesis chapter 1, 14 through 18. The Bible says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Now we'll stop there. First of all, the Bible says he made what? Two great lights. So both the lesser and the greater are great lights to give light to the what? To the earth. But the greater light rules the day. What's the greater light? The sun. The, le the, 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 le the lesser light. In, in a physical reality, the sun, the sun gives light upon the earth. Now, the lesser light gives light upon the earth at night. What is that? The moon. Does the moon have its own light? No, it borrows light from the sun. It reflects the light. So the lesser light just gets the light from the, the greater light, which is the sun, and reflects that light. All right. So let's let's go a little further. In Malachi, chapter four, verse two. Malachi 4, verse 2, Jesus Christ is called the son of righteousness. Jesus Christ, biblically or prophetically, is represented as the son. Now, if Jesus Christ is the son, if Jesus Christ is the son, who would be the ones or the individuals that would reflect his light? His prophets. His prophets. And as a matter of fact, there's a statement that lets us know very clearly that even John the Baptist was a lesser light. Notice what it says in Desire of Ages, page 220. Desire of Ages, page 220. And you can connect this if you want Bible text. You can connect it with John 1, verse 6 through 10, which shows that John came to give witness to the light. He was not that light, but came to give witness of the light. So he was a lesser light. And Sister White says, Desire of Ages, page 220 on page 9. It says, The prophet John was the connecting link between two dispensations. As God's representative, he stood forth to show the relation of the law and the prophets to the Christian dispensation. 
he was what? The lesser light, which was to be followed by a greater. Who's the greater light? Christ. So the greater light is Christ, the lesser lights are the prophet. Now, if you want to say the Bible is the greater light, the Bible is the word of God. Jesus is the word. But the Bible is made up of the testimony of who? Of the prophets, which is the testimony of who? Jesus. So if we belittle the prophet's message, in reality, who are we belittling? Christ. So the lesser light, greater light should not be an issue for us. It just lets us know the place that she holds is she represents the light that Christ gave her. Notice what it says in Review and Herald, page 8, I mean, April 8, 1873, on page 9. It says, said Christ in vindication of John, but what went you for out to see, a prophet? Yeah, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. Not only was John a prophet to foretell future events, but he was the child of promise, filled with the Holy Spirit from his birth, and was ordained of God to execute a special work as a reformer in preparing a people for the reception of Christ. The prophet John was a connecting link between two dispensations. Now, this is the second time we've heard that. And we're going to get into what a dispensation is and how John is the connecting link. All right. But we want to see, first of all, that more than means greater than. If I'm greater than a prophet, you can you, you can say that you're more than a prophet. They're interchangeable. So when it came to John, he said he was more than a prophet. But when it comes to Moses, notice what it says in Selected Messages, book three, page 74. It says, excuse me, uh, volume four of Spirit of Prophecy, page 295. The quote right above that one. It says, the Lord then told them that Moses was what? Greater than a prophet. And that he had revealed himself to Moses in a more direct manner than to a prophet. Said the Lord, with him I will speak mouth to mouth. So Moses was greater than a prophet. John the Baptist was greater than a prophet. Now notice what Sister White says about her work. She says, I am now instructed that I may not, it says, I am now instructed that I am not to be hindered in my work by those who engage in suppositions regarding its nature, whose minds are struggling with so many intricate problems connecting with the supposed work of a prophet. My commission embraces the work of a prophet, but it does not end there. It embraces what? Much more than the minds of those who have been sowing the seeds of unbelief can comprehend. John the Baptist was a reformer. He was not only saying future events, he was a reformer. Moses brought reform. Not only did he foretell future events, but he brought reform. Ellen White, not only does she give understanding of future events, but she's a reformer. She's more than a prophet. And she stands in the category of John the Baptist, Moses, and we're going to soon see Noah. These individuals, she stands in line with them. Now, if you can think of any other prophet that had a very or more powerful ministry than Noah and Moses and John the Baptist. But she stands with these four, these three men. Very powerful, powerful position. But remember, it said that, that John the Baptist was a connecting link prophet between two dispensations. Now, those prophets that are more than prophets are the ones that are designated as connecting link prophets. And I'll show you what it means. But the word dispensation in, in the Encarta Dictionary it means a divinely ordained religious system, a divine ordering or management of affairs and events in the world, the time during which a religious doctrine or practice is believed to be in force. So there were dispensations that these prophets connected. Notice Noah. Noah took us from the gates of Eden to altars. After, after Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, they would come by the, by the gate and they would worship there every Sabbath, we're told. They were there and they would, they would have their sacrifices right there. But Noah took us after the flood and he set up an altar. A dispensation change took place from the gates to an altar. Moses took us from the altars to the earthly sanctuary. A dispensational change transpired. John the Baptist took us from the earthly to the heavenly sanctuary when he, be, when he pointed to Christ saying, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. There was a change of dispensation. And then finally, Ellen White takes us from the holy to the most holy place. There was a change in dispensation. And the question I ask you is this. After the most holy place, what else is there? The second coming, Christ comes. Michael stands up. It's done. Now, there's many people who get into the argument of, 
Well, is there another prophet after Ellen White? Is there more prophets? And you hear all these different individuals have these so-called prophets. Now, whether you want to say Joe 2 and Acts 2, that in the end of time, God might have give people visions and dreams is one thing. But there will never be another prophet that stands in the same category as Ellen White. That's the last dispensational connecting link prophet, the last one. And there's a statement, matter of fact, in volume five of the testimonies. You have it on your page, page 661. Notice this, and it's a bold statement, but remember, it's the words of Christ. It says, in ancient times, God spoke to men by the mouth of prophets and apostles. In these last days, he speaks to them by the testimonies of his spirit, which are her writings. It says, there was never a time when God instructed his people more earnestly than he instructs them now concerning his will and the course that he would have them pursue. In other words, there has never been another prophet who God has used in a more powerful way in their writings to instruct God's people. She's the last one. She's the last one. So those who might come with these big books claiming to be prophets, they're the last one. Ellen White, was done, she's, she's the last connecting link prophet. Now this brings us to our time and our history and in Revelation chapter 3, verse 18, we have 10 minutes here. Revelation chapter 3, verse 18 brings us to the Laodicean church or the Laodicean experience. And in verse 18, to answer the Laodicean experience of being wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, God offers us three things. He says we can buy it from him what? Gold tried in the fire. What else? White raiment, and the last, I said. All right? Now, we're told in Review and Herald, August 19, 1890, it says the state of the church represented by the foolish virgins is also spoken of as the Laodicean state. So whatever church represents the foolish virgins or the wise virgins, the ten virgins, it also represents Laodicea. And then great controversy, 393, the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 also illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. So the Laodicean church, I'm sure we understand, is the Seventh-day Adventist church, last and final church. And so the Seventh-day Adventist church is in a condition of being wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. God has given us three things that would answer to that condition, the white raiment, the eye salve, and the faith that works by love, which is the gold. Now in Testimonies, Volume 9, Page 97. On page 11, it says the time of visitation on the top. We need to put into perspective that the test that we're talking about here is for God's people. Laodicea, for the Adventist church. It says, oh, that the people might know the time of their visitation. There are many who have not yet heard the testing truth for this time. There are many with whom the spirit of God is striving the time of God's destructive judgments is the time for mercy for those who have no opportunity to learn what is true. Tenderly will the Lord look upon them. His heart of mercy is touched. His hand is still stretched out to save while the door of mercy is closed to those who would not enter. I want to suggest to you, based on many things that Jeff has already said and things that we'll look at together, that the probation closes on the church first. And it closes upon us at the Sunday law. But prior to the close of probation, we have tests. And the first one is the message of the prophet. We need to define now, is her message life or death? Is her message to a remnant? And does her name correspond with our, her ministry or the needs of the church? Now, we looked at the gold, the white raiment, and the eyes have gold is faith that works by love and purifies the soul. The white raiment is what? Righteousness of Christ and the eye salve. What is eye salve? Now you're reading from the page. <laughs> you're reading from the page there. But the eye salve, what, what, what is the eye salve? Common answer to what the eye salve is. Spiritual discernment, some said the Holy Spirit. It reads something to you. It says, it says here, if you have the study Bible, you can turn there with me. <clears throat> yes, sir. In Revelation chapter 3, under uh, verse 18, the title on the top of the page, if you have the big study Bible, is Correct Views for the Conscience. 
It says, the eye is the sensitive conscience, the inner light of the mind. Upon its correct view of things, the spiritual healthfulness of the whole soul and being depend. The eye salve, the word of God, makes the conscience smart under its application for it convicts of sin. She says that the eye salve is the what? The word. The eye salve is the word of God. Now, let's go ahead and look at the name of Ellen White. And let's see if her name corresponds with the needs of the Laodicean church, which were threefold. We need the gold, the white raiment, and the eye salve. Let's look at the first one. On your page, on page 11, Ellen needs a bright and shining lamp. Now, Psalms 119, 105, what does it say? Thy word is a what? Lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Ellen corresponds to the need of the eye salve, the word of God. Then you look at the second, her second, her middle name, Gould. Gould means gold. It's an old English term for gold. And so her, her middle name corresponds with the need of gold. White raiment. White raiment comes from the understanding of white. The name white or Ellen White is white or righteousness. Now in Revelation 19, flip with me there. Revelation 19 and verse 8. Revelation 19 and verse 8. The Bible also gives us testimony that white is synonymous with righteousness. Revelation 19, 8 says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So the very needs of the Laodicean church are answered by Ellen Gould White. And I want to put into perspective now, because I've been approached by this before. This is not to say that her individual faith is going to be our faith. No, no, no. It's not what it means. It doesn't mean that the righteousness that God might give her is our righteousness. It's showing that the ministry she brings to the church is to answer the need to bring us out of the Laodicean experience. And if we cut her off in the communications that God sends through her, we cut ourselves off from righteousness. And that's what, that's what the Bible says. Matter of fact, look with me in Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Notice what it says in verse 20. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. The Bible says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man what? Hear my voice and open the door. I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Now whether you've looked at it in this way or not the voice of Christ the voice of Christ we, we have a picture that he's standing outside the door of our hearts knocking and calling out but what is his voice remember the statement in desire of ages it's the voice of Christ that speaks through patriarchs and prophets from Eden to the closing scenes of time it's the voice of Christ through the prophets that if we would hear his voice he would come in but if we cut off that voice, he stays on the outside. We'll come back to that in just a moment. You can look in on page 12. Many question and say, well, what about her, her maiden name? What about her na maiden name before she married James White? Well, still Ellen is a bright and shining lamp. Good is gold. But Harmon means a soldier of peace. And if you look at the Philadelphian time period, there's a statement here in volume 7 of Bible Commentary page 974, it says, those who love and keep the commandments of God are the most obnoxious to the synagogue of Satan, and the powers of evil will manifest their hatred towards them to the fullest extent possible. John foresaw the conflict between the remnant church and the power of evil, and said the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. During the time period of the Millerites, or during the time period before, I should say, she was married to, to James White. She was a soldier of peace. And indeed, it's because we're in a war. It's a war between the dragon and the seed of the woman. Now, three minutes left. If you look on page 12 where it says the very last deception. Volume 1, page Selected, me selected Messages, volume 1, page 48. It says, Satan is constantly pressing in the spurious to lead away from the truth. Now, interesting thing, if you, if you just take it as she's writing in context, notice, 
Satan is constantly pressing in the spurious to lead away from the truth. The very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of God's spirit. The very last deception of Satan is to make God's people lose their, their confidence or, or to have it on the walls but not read it. The testimonies of God's spirit, the spirit of prophecy. But before that it says Satan is constantly pressing in the spurious to lead away from the truth. Now if she's talking about the testimonies of the spirit of prophecy or the words of the prophet, Satan always comes in with, hey, there's another prophet. Hey, there, this man has more light on the prophet. He, he's come up after Ellen White. There's a lady right now in Riverside, California. Is anybody from Riverside here? All right. There's a lady right now in Riverside, California, who claims to be the next prophet. And there are all type of young people from La Sierra and Loma Linda going to this lady to hear her prophecies. But what does it say? Now, the interesting thing is, when you bring them the spirit of prophecy, Ellen White, they, they say, well, no, her supersedes it, so we can push that aside. But what does it say? Satan is constantly pressing in the spurious to lead away from the truth. And the very last deception is to bring us to where we have no confidence in the spirit of prophecy. And that's been in the church for a long time. For a long time. It says, where well, there is no vision, the people perish. Satan will work ingeniously in different ways and through different agencies to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people and the true testimony. About one month ago, I was preaching in a Spanish church in Corona, and I won't say the name of the church for the tape. Um, and I was asking the Lord what he wanted me to start off with. And so I was led to do this particular presentation. And at the end of the presentation, there was an uproar in the church. Now, I don't speak Spanish. But when they started standing up and yelling back and forth and some were even crying, I didn't know what had transpired. But about a year or two before I, I came there, the pastor had got all the church members to bring their spirit of prophecy books and to put them in a big pile in, on, in the driveway. They poured gasoline over all of them and began to lit it on fire and began to dance around the bonfire saying we've been liberated from Adventism. And it had taken such hold upon the church that the church was split on the issue. And so there were people there who still had the idea that spirit of prophecy needs to be done away with. And so when we went through this particular presentation, I realized at the end why these women and men were crying. And one of them actually came up and grabbed me by the arm and says, does it mean that I'm lost because I, because I, I put her away? Well, I don't want to necessarily say the man is lost because he recognizes now the truth. But there are many who became so rigid and hard against it that they said, no matter what you say, we believe we've been liberated. They are the ones that have cut themselves off from light, cut themselves off from truth. And what's the result? Probation closing. No more light. They can't see why it's important. No more light. No Holy Spirit. And brethren, the latter rain is being poured out now. And probation closes. In Review and Herald, July 20, 1897. It says, God is dishonored when we do not receive the communications which he sends. Thus, we refuse the golden oil which he would pour into our soul to be communicated to those in darkness. The foolish virgins did not have the oil. The Laodiceans did not receive the communications and left Christ outside. To not receive the communications of the Spirit or the testimony of God's Spirit, the Spirit of prophecy, is to not receive the golden oil. To not receive the golden oil means that you are a foolish virgin. To be a foolish virgin means you stay in the Laodicean experience. To stay in the Laodicean experience means you're spewed out. And to be spewed out means you're rejected and cut off and probation closes. It's extremely important at this time that we listen to God's communications through the testimonies of the spirit of prophecy. Amen. Amen. Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful for your love and your protection. We're so grateful that we can come to places such as this to study and to learn from one another. And Father, I pray that as we're all here, we would remember that iron sharpeneth iron and sword against sword. And that, dear Lord, as we teach each other and the Holy Spirit teaches us all, that you would guide us and help us grow and help us to not go home from this experience 
the same. Help us to be changed. Help us to have a more firm footing in the trust of the spirit of prophecy. Help us, dear Father, to indeed be ones who would receive the holy oil, the communications of God's spirit, therefore taking us out of the experience of foolish virgins and Laodiceans, and on, dear Father, to be a wise virgin. Thank you, dear Lord, for all that you've done for us. Guide us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.